As Moti said, um, it's 78 to 23 is, is almost 50 years eh? since I left Waterloo. And it, it feels very strange to be back, actually. I haven't been, I think I've been back maybe two, or maybe twice in the 80s and once in the 90s and not since then. Um, so it, it feels strange because it's changed so much, but at the same time, it seems very familiar. So especially with the uh, people I've known since then of uh, David and Murty and, and seeing Bruce in the audience, it's, it's, um, it brings back happy memories. Uh, and in fact, I was, it's, it's, it feels strange being in this room because I have a distinct memory of um, being a PhD student and taking a, a, a graduate course from my a PhD supervisor, Adrian Bondi, in here, in which he didn't do much work. He got the graduate students to present papers that he chose, but he chose them very, very well. So I think uh, the three presentations I remember were, there was one on um, Nash-Williams theorem that uh, Dirac graphs have many edge-disjoint Hamilton cycles, and there was a presentation on a Another result about Hamilton cycles due to Woodall. Um, and another one about uh, Herbert Fleischner's uh, square of a block theorem, that the square of a block is. And, and all three results played uh, a, a really important part of my PhD thesis. Uh, so I think probably I owe my PhD thesis to, to that course in this room. And Adrian, of course. Uh, and all, also, I've, in my career, I've got to know all three mathematicians very well, so Woodall and Fleischner and Nash-Williams. Um, so it was very significant for me. Uh, so as Murty said, I started off in Hamiltonian graph theory with Adrian, and then um, I, I got interested in graph connectivity and worked with uh, Andras Frank and uh, Thibaut Jordan in uh, Budapest. And uh, Tibor spent, in the early 2000s, he spent a long time trying to get me interested in uh, rigidity of graphs, uh, rigidity of frameworks, which, which I'll tell you about. And it's, um, it's a very attractive, but it's, very, it's a difficult subject to get into because it's a mixture of lots of things. So it's graph theory, uh, metroid theory, um, discrete geometry, algebraic geometry, analytic geometry. And, and many of these things were new to me. So the combinatorial side is, came easy because I'm a, I'm a graph theorist. But the, the geometric side, I did and still do have a lot of difficulty with. So, so my uh, motivation is to try to, to reduce these difficult geometric concepts to combinatorics. So, so I'll tell you about it. So, so, um, uh, this is uh, the talks about the rigidity of simplicial complexes, and it's joint work with James Krugshank, who's in Galway, and Shinichi Tanigawa, who's in Tokyo. Hmm. 
Good. So, so what I'll be talking about is, is, is frameworks, which are also called by Loebus, I think they're called geometric graphs. So it, it's, a, it's a graph which has been um, embedded in, in D-dimensional Euclidean space. And um, I think of the graph as being in, in, in Euclidean space as a, a straight line realization. So the edges are just straight lines joining the, the vertices. And the length of an edge is a, a, the Euclidean distance between its endpoints. So this is um, definition of uh, global rigidity. So we say it's global. So the idea is that. Um, we consider all frameworks which have the same edge lengths as our original framework. And if every such framework is congruent to um, the original framework, then we say the original framework is globally rigid. So, so this is the same thing as saying that we can get it from the original framework as um, translation or rotation or reflection or a mixture of, of all of those. And it's equivalent to saying that the edge lengths of this frameworks JP and JQ are the same. Uh, <coughs> oh, the pointer. Thank you. Uh, so this is global rigidity. Uh, so rigidity is kind of local rigidity. So it's the same as um, uh, global rigidity in some small neighborhood. Or another way of saying it, it is, it is um, rigidity, but where you do, not, you do not consider all congruent frameworks. You just, you just, sorry, you don't consider all frameworks with the same edge lengths. You only consider uh, frameworks which you can reach by continuously moving the vertices in such a way that the edge lengths don't change. <coughs> Is that so? I, I, I should have said so. Please interrupt me and ask questions. So I, I, I like. Uh, I like seminars in which I don't do all the talking. So here's an example. So these are two uh, two-dimensional frameworks. And um, so our original framework can be continuously deformed into this one just by moving the, the top two vertices. And um, so this framework has the same edge lengths as this framework. But they're not congruent because the distance between V2 and V4 has changed. So uh, this shows that the f in original framework, GP0, is not rigid. And because it's not rigid, it's not globally rigid. So we, we can't make it rigid by putting another edge between V1 and V3. So if we put this, this edge which braces the rectangle, then the only continuous motions of this framework in R squared are a translation or a rotation. The only continuous motions of the vertices which preserves the lengths of the edges. So this, this um, braced uh, framework is rigid in R squared, but it's not globally rigid in R squared because I can keep the top triangle fixed and I can reflect V4 in the line through V1 and V3. So V4 will, will pop over to the other side of the line, but this reflection will not change the lengths of any of the edges. So it, 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 it's, it's a, I get a framework which is, has the same edge lengths as the original framework, and it's not congruent to the original framework because the distance between V2 and V4 will change after the reflection. So this is, this is flexible. It's not rigid. This is, this is rigid, but it's not globally rigid. 
And to make it globally rigid, I, I could add another breath here. And then it would become a complete graph. And by definition, complete graphs are globally rigid. <coughs> it, so rigidity and global rigidity also, also depend on the, um, the dimension of the ambient space. So, so this is rigid in, in R squared but it's not rigid in, in, in three-dimensional space, because in three-dimensional space, I, I can rotate V4 about this line. And again, it will change the distance between V2 and V4. So this is rigid in R squared, but not R cubed. Does, any questions? Um, so, it's, it's a hard problem to decide if a, a framework is rigid. So, uh, the first complexity result was due to Sachs in 1979, and he showed that global rigidity in our day is, is um, NP hard. And in fact, um, what he does is he shows that it's NP hard to decide if a, a cycle embedded on the real line is globally rigid. So the, the cycle fixes the, um, the edge lengths between um, uh, a sequence of vertices. And you can imagine it. So it's, it, you can write it as um, you have a sequence of numbers which, which add up to a fixed number. And you want to you have to decide. Um, no, they don't add up. So, so on the real line, I, I guess you can go from left to right or right to left. So each of the numbers gets a sign, and you have to decide if there's a unique way of signing those numbers so that the sum is equal to a, a zero. And so if you write, if you say it like that, it sounds like an MP complete problem. And then in his uh, master's thesis in 2008, Abbott showed that uh, actually rigidity is, uh, is NP complete as well for D greater or equal to 2. So it's not so difficult to say that um, a graph embedded on the line is rigid if and only if it's connected. So if it's not connected, you can, you can move to the components along the line freely. And that preserves the edge lengths, but it changes the distance between different components. And to show the, 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 the opposite direction, you can just use, choose a spanning tray and, and use induction on the number of leaves. So, uh, so, so that sounds uh, kind of bad. Oh, sorry. Doesn't work so well from over here. Um, so the good news for me as a graph theorist is that if, if, we, um, if we just restrict our attention to almost all frameworks or, or generic frameworks, so those in which the embedding is um, the coordinates of the, the points in the embedding are algebraically independent over the rationals, then the nature of the problem changes. So for these NP um, hardness results, what goes wrong is a, is a particular embedding in, in our day space. So if instead you look at, at almost all embeddings, or generic embeddings, then the rigidity or global rigidity of the framework only depends on the graph. So defining, deciding rigidity or glo global rigidity becomes a, a graph theory problem. And we've, so we've already seen that uh, um, in one dimension, a graph is, is rigid if and only if it's connected. So it turns out that it's the, um, a generic embedding of a graph in, in, in one dimensional space is globally rigid if and only if the graph is two connected. So if the graph is on the line and it has a cut vertex, 
we can um, reflect one of the, um, the blocks attached to the cut vertex on the line, and it, it changes the, uh, the real, it changes the distance between vertices. But if it's too connected, we can't do that. So it's, it's a bit more difficult than the, um, the graph theoretic result, but you can use an AAD composition of the, the graph and show that uh, a graph uh, embedded in one dimensional space is globally rigid if it's too connected. Uh, so because these things only depend on the graph, we can say a graph is globally rigid in our day or is rigid in our day if, if some or every generic realization is, is rigid or globally rigid. And it's, it's a big problem, at least in, in discrete geometry, to decide which graphs are, are rigid or globally rigid in our day. So we've seen that... Um, Rigidity and global rigidity are, 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 are not so difficult for d equals 1. Um, rigidity is also solved for d equals 2. And it was a famous theorem of um, a Dutch engineer called Lahman in 1970 that characterized rigid graphs in two-dimensional space. And then more, quite recently, a few years ago, um, this result of... Um, Hilda Polacek Geringer from 1927 was discovered, so it was published in German, so I guess the English speakers didn't really, um, it disappeared in, in the dark of history, but she proved this characterization of rigidity in R squared um, a long time before Lahman. And then, um, so Tibor Jordan got me interested in this stuff, and, and uh, we solved the, together we solved the global rigidity problem in R squared um, in 2005. And for D greater or equal to three, it, it, the thing is completely open, deciding which graphs are rigid or globally rigid. So, our, um, this, so our three dimension, even in three dimensions, these problems seem to be hard. So what people have done is they've looked at, at special families of, of graphs. And um, for this talk, what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at um, one skeletons of simplicial complexes. So they have a nice uh, locally dense structure, and we can use that to to characterize rigidity and global rigidity. Not for all simplicial complexes, but we'll say for a, a large family of simplicial complexes. So, so for my purposes, a, a simplicial complex, I'm just thinking of being a hypergraph in, in which each set has size um, k plus 1. So a simplicial k complex of course, simplicial complexes come with all of the, the subs subsets of these sets as well, but, but at least to play with them, I, I'm just going to consider the facets. And, and also, for, for technical reasons, which we'll see in a minute, I want to allow um, multiple copies of the same um, facet. So I'll call this a simplicial multi-complex, and I'll reserve simplicial complex for ones which don't contain multiple copies of the same facet. And as I said, they come with all the subsets, so an R face of a simplicial complex is just a, a subset of one of the, the K plus 1 sets of size R plus 1. And zero faces are vertices, and one faces are edges. And the graph for one skeleton of the complex is just the a simple graph with um, vertex set and the vertices of the complex and edge set the, the edges of the complex. And we'll also come up with, uh, we'll use this notion of a missing R face. Um, I'm not 
completely convinced it's good terminology, but, but the idea is if you think of the one skeleton, the one skeleton may contain cliques. So each, each R face will correspond to a, an R plus one clique in the, the one skeleton. But you can have R plus one cliques in the one skeleton which don't correspond to R faces. We can have lots of R faces. So the, the, the clique just is a, it's a union of edges, and each of these edges could belong to different um, faces. So we will call this a missing R face if it's uh, an R plus one clique in the one skeleton, but it's not an R face in the complex. Is that, is that OK? Um, so the family of simplicial complexes which we're going to show are rigid or globally rigid are simplicial care circuits. So again, these, these have a nice combinatorial structure. So the, the general, more general complex is a simplicial care cycle, and this is a simplicial care multi-complex with the property that, that every face um, of size less, one less than the facets is contained in an even number of facets. So being a graph theorist, that I, I kind of drag things back to graph theory and so a, a simplicial one cycle is a, a multigraph with the property that every edge, you know, every vertex is contained in an even number of edges. So it's a, it's a not necessarily connected Eulerian graph. So every vertex has even degree. And a, a simplicial care cycle, which is minimal with respect to inclusion, so it's a simplicial care cycle, and it doesn't properly contain any other simplicial care cycles, is a simplicial care circuit. So again, going back to graphs, uh, a simplicial one circuit is a Eulerian graph with the property that no subgraph is a, a cycle. So, so no subgraph is an Eulerian graph. So it's, it's, a, it's a graph cycle. And then if you think about the, the easy graph theory so that, that every Eulerian graph can be decomposed into graph cycles. Um, the same proof would, would, would show that every simplicial care cycle can be decomposed into pairwise disjoint simplicial care circuits. So if I have a simplicial care cycle, I can, and it probably contains another simplicial care cycle, I can just delete it, and what's left is a simplicial care cycle. So I can keep on um, pulling it apart until everything that's left is a care circuit. Uh, so a fundamental example of, of simplicial care circuits are triangulated surfaces. So these give us simplicial two circuits. So the, 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 the faces of my triangulated circuit are my Two simplexes, or are my, uh, are my um, two faces? And every edge in the triangulation is contained in exactly two triangles. So a, a triangulated surface gives me a simplicial um, two cycle in which every edge is contained exactly two faces. And it's fairly easy to say that, that if it's a, I guess it has to be a connected surface. Eh? If I allow disconnected surfaces, I would have a cycle. But if I have a connected surface, then, then any triangulation can't have a, a sub-triangulation. So. so it's a circuit. And the smallest simplicial circuits are, are the trivial circuits where I just take two copies of the same K plus one set.
so this means that, that, that every non-trivial simplicial K circuit must be um, a simplicial K complex. So if it's non-trivial, it can't contain any other K cycles. So in particular, it can't contain the trivial K cycle. So a, a non-trivial simplicial K circuit can't contain multiple copies of the same uh, K plus one, K phase. So, so simplicial circuits, K circuits are nice because they're examples of simplicial um, K complexes, not K multi-complexes. And they also have a nice metroid theory interpretation. So they're, um, they are the circuits of this simplicial K metroid on the um, complete K plus one uniform hypergraph. So the ground set of, of my metroid are the subsets of V of size K plus one and a set of um, hyper edges is a circuit if it's a simplicial care circuit. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use um, inductive induction to show that, to show that every simplicial care circuit is rigid in RK plus one. So if we take a generic real embedding of the vertices in K plus one dimensional um, Euclidean space, then the, the resulting of the, of the one skeleton, then the resulting framework is rigid. And our main tool is gonna to be induction and, and we're gonna use edge contraction on the simplicial circuit. So I have to say what edge contraction is in a simplicial complex or a simplicial multi-complex. Um, so I, I, I choose a, an edge and the first thing I do is I delete all of the, the K faces which contain that edge. So I, in graph theory, it's like deleting the loops, any loops that I get when I contract an edge. And then uh, each K face, which contains uh, exactly one of the vertices, well, so, so I'm thinking of contracting my edge is UV, and I'm con thinking of contracting V onto U. So V is going to disappear, and I'm just going to be left with U. So every K face, which contains V and not U, gets replaced by a K face, which contains U and not V. And I want to allow this operation to create multiple copies of the same K phase. So if, the, if S minus V plus U already existed in my simplicial complex, then I would get two copies of that K phase. And, and I need to do that because um, I want simplicial K cycles to be closed under edge contraction. So again, going back to graph theory, if you have a... Um, if you have an Eulerian graph and you contract an edge and you want this contraction to preserve being Eulerian, then you have to keep multiple edges. So this, this is the same phenomenon. And it's with a bit of thought, you can say that edge contraction of complexes and graphs are compatible in the sense that, that if I take the graph of a, a complex um, after contracting an edge, it's the same as um, taking the graph of the complex and then contracting an edge, as long as there's... Um, as long as each, other, each edge was, is contained in some complex which doesn't contain the edge. The, the edge I'm contracting. So here's an example. So this, um, this is a triangulation of the plane or, or the sphere. And I have an edge um, UV. 
which I'm going to contract. So when I contract u and v, the first thing I do is I throw away the, the triangles which contain uh, my edge u, v. So I throw away s7 and s8. And then for each of the faces which contains v and not u, I replace it by um, s minus v plus u. So s6 gets the same vertex set as s5. S4 gets the same vertex set as S3. And S2 gets the same vertex set as S1. So I end up with this simplicial multi-complex. And this is a simplicial two-circuit, because it's a triangulation of the sphere. And after I do this contraction, it, it's not a simplicial two-circuit anymore, because it contains three copies of the trivial um, simplicial two circuit. So my edge contraction preserves being a simplicial K cycle, but it doesn't preserve being a simplicial K circuit. But I, what I can do is I can, I can decompose this simplicial K cycle into three edge disjoint simplicial K circuits. So I've got S5, X6, and S3, S4, and S1, S2. And the game we're going to play is we're going to take the inverse image of, of these three simplicial care circuits to get new simplicial care circuits over here. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, uh, I guess I've said this before. So, we'd like to prove rigidity about simplicial circuits by um, choosing an edge E, contracting the edge and applying induction to the, the smaller complex, and then there is um, a result of Walter Whiteley, uh, which tells us, which allows us to return from S contract E back to S. So, I'll, I'll give Walter's result in detail later, but, but it allows us to go backwards. So if we start off with a simplicial circuit and I contract an edge and I get a new simplicial circuit, then I'm happy because uh, Walter's, Whiteley, Walter's result will send me through. The difficulty is we don't know whether we can always find an edge E in a simplicial circuit such that after contraction we get another simplicial circuit. So it's, um, it's a bit like the problem of, of you have a triangulated surface and you want to contract an edge such that you get another triangulation of the same surface. So this is a hard problem. Um, so Fogelsanger was um, a PhD student of Bob Connolly at Cornell and he came up with a really neat idea for, for getting around this problem. So his neat idea was to say, well, I won't worry about getting a smaller simplicial circuit because I know that after I contract an edge, I get a simplicial cycle. And I know that I can decompose that simplicial cycle into disjoint simplicial circuits. So I can apply induction to each of these smaller simplicial care circuits. The trick is that, 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 that when he goes back from the, the, the simplicial circuits in the contracted complex to the original complex, they don't correspond to simplicial cycles even. So when he takes the inverse image of these contracted circuits. But what he does is he augments them by adding new k faces, which new is a bit, uh, additional would be a better word, I think by adding additional faces to make them into simplicial care circuits. And these additional faces are either the faces that we throw away because they contain UV, or they'll turn out to be missing faces. So they, they correspond to cliques in the one skeleton, even though they're not faces in the complex. 
And because they correspond to cliques in the one skeleton, and we're only interested in the rigidity of the one skeleton, this, 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 um, it doesn't destroy our inductive proof. So I'll give an example of the fogel sanger decomposition uh, next. But, but before the example, I'd just like to, to try and say what it is. So, um, so S is a, a, a non-trivial simplicial chaos circuit, and A is, is any edge of, of this um, simplicial chaos circuit, of this simplicial complex. Then we can find um, simplicial chaos circuits S1 up to Sn, such that um, the vertex set of the smaller complex simplicial chaos circuits is contained in the vertex set of the original. The union of the edge sets of the smaller simplicial circuits is, is the, the edge set of the original. For every edge in the, the, the um, in these circuits, when I contract the edge, I get a simplicial care circuit. And in fact, it's, it's, it's the simplicial care circuits in the decomposition of, of S contract A. And then I want to prove rigidity. So um, the idea is that, that I want these smaller circuits to overlap. So each, by induction, each of the smaller circuits is rigid. And if they overlap in sufficiently many vertices, if you overlap two rigid things in sufficiently many vertices, the new thing is rigid. So um, they have this nice property that in this, this ordering, if the ith simplicial care circuit has some uh, care face in common with the union with one of the, its predecessors. So we, by induction, we're going to prove inductively that this is rigid, and we, in, by induction, this is rigid, and then I've got two rigid things intersecting in k plus one vertices, so the union is going to turn out to be rigid. So maybe a more likely to get questions on the example than the, um, the statement. So, so this, this is the, the, the example we had before. So I contract UV in this simplicial care circuit, and I get this simplicial, simplicial two circuit, simplicial two cycle, which is the union of three um, trivial simplicial two circuits. And now I take the inverse image of each of these simplicial two circuits. So S1, S2's inverse image is uh, S1, S2. And it has four vertices. So if I want it to correspond to a simplicial care circuit, it, it's going to have to be a, um, uh, it's going to have to be the tetrahedron. It's going to have to be a, um, triangulation of, uh, of uh, the sphere with four faces. So I've got two faces. Now I, I, want to, I have to add some additional faces. So one of my missing faces is UWV, and that exists as S8. So I take the inverse image of S1, S2, and I add S8 to it, and I also have to add U. Z, V. So this is not a face in the original simplicial complex. It's a missing face. So U, Z, V is a triangle in the original one skeleton. It's a K3 in the original one skeleton. So I'll call that S9. And when I add, I take the inverse image, S1, S2. I, I add the deleted face, and then I add another missing face. And this gives me the tetrahedron, which is a simplicial two circuit. And now I clear the same game with S3, S4. S3, S4. So I need another tetrahedron on U, Z, V, Y. 
I know I had two missing faces. I had the missing face S9 before, U, Z, V, um, U. And I had a new missing face, U, Y, V, U. So I had this new face, uh, S10. And then I, I played the same game with S5X6. And uh, S5X6, I need a tetrahedron on U, Y, V, X. So uh, S5X6, S7, and S10. So now I've, I've covered the one skeleton of um, my original simplicial circuit with four tetrahedra, with four um, simplicial, my original simplicial two circuit with four simplicial two circuits. And by induction, these are all rigid in R square, in R cubed. The tetrahedron's rigid in R cubed. And then um, S, not too many S's, eh? <laughs> Script, uh, script S1 has a triangle in common with script S2. And so I've got these two tetrahedra which intersect on a triangle in R cubed. And if this is rigid and this is rigid, then the intersection on a triangle makes the union rigid. And then the union of script S1 and script S2 has a triangle in common with S3. In fact, it's probably got two triangles in common. So the union, again, it's rigid. And that tells me that the, the one skeleton of the original complex is rigid in our code. Is, is that OK? So, um, so this, this is all due to Fogelsanger in his PhD thesis. Um, so the ingredients of the, the proof that I just incared, indicated are that um, we want to apply induction after we contract an edge. So this is Whiteley's vertex splitting lemma. So if I have a graph, I have an edge which belongs to at least d minus 1 triangles. And if the contracted graph is rigid in d-dimensional spares, then the original graph is rigid in d-dimensional spares. And the fact that I'm working with, simpli with um, simplicial circuits gives me these d minus 1 common neighbors because the edge E belongs to at least two um, facets. No, sorry. Uh, K minus one faces. Or, I, I, I'm confusing K and D hopeless, hopelessly here, but you can imagine that, that, that if I have an edge which belongs to two, two big um, faces, then it will belong to lots of triangles. And then there's the glowing lemma, which we've mentioned, is that if I have two graphs with at least d vertices in common, which are both rigid in our day, then their union is rigid in our day. So this is Fogelsanger's proof. And, and I'm repeating myself here, but never mind. It's a nice proof. So the, the, his, his amazing result is that the graph of every simplicial day circuit is rigid in R d plus 1 for all d greater or equal to 2. So it's induction on the number of vertices. If, if it's a trivial simplicial day circuit, then it's one skeleton is a complete graph, and complete graphs are rigid if anything's going to be rigid. 
so we assume it's not non-trivial, and we can, that means we can choose a, a fogel sandler decomposition. And then for each circuit in the fogel sandler decomposition, the contracted graph is rigid in Rd plus 1. And then by Whiteley's vertex splitting theorem, we can go back to the original. So the, the original um, simplicial circuit is uh, rigid in Rd plus 1. And now, so now we've got these M um, simplicial circuits which have rigid one skeletons, and we just have to glue them together. So we use the gluing lemma to do that. So we, we show that the union of the first I of them is rigid in our D plus one for all I. And that holds because the ith circuit has um, at least D plus one vertices in common with the union of the preceding circuit. So this implies that the, the one skeleton of every connected simplicial D manifold, because it's a simplicial D circuit, it's going to be rigid in our D plus one. So it gives us a large family of um, graphs which are rigid in our D plus one. And this, this extends previous results so, of, um, so Gluck proved this for simplicial polyhedra. So in three dimensions, so triangulations of the sphere. Uh, Whiteley proved it for simplicial D plus one dimensional polytopes. So he, he um, extended Gluck's result to higher dimensions. And Kalai proved it, also proved it for simplicial D manifolds, but only for D greater or equal to three because he used Whiteley's result as the base of his induction and Whiteley's result just used just worked for polytopes. And the, the also in, in discrete geometry, there's a famous um, celebrated result of Barnett called the lower bound theorem, which gives a lower bound on the number of edges in a, um, a polytope. And it's been extended to generalizations of polytopes by many people. So it's a lower bound in terms of the number of edges in terms of the number of vertices. So Fogel-Sanders theorem implies the lower bound theorem because in order to be rigid, it needs to have a certain number of edges in terms of the number of vertices. And this certain number of edges just happens to be Barnett's number. How, how long have I got? Do you usually finish? Five or ten minutes, okay. Um, so, so Fogelsanger proved this in 88, and he never published his result, which is why it's, it, it's, it hasn't received the attention that, that's due to it. So he was, he was interested in dance, so he, I think he opened, instead of publishing his result, he opened a dance studio. So, um, Working with um, Jim Krugshank and Shinichi Tanigawa, we've extended um, Fogelsanger's result to prove global rigidity. So we characterize when a simplicial um, D circuit is uh, globally rigid in our D plus one. And in order to do that, we need, so there were the two fundamental results we needed for rigidity. There was the vertex splitting lemma, which is the inverse of edge contraction, and also a gluing lemma. So we have versions of both of these things for global rigidity, but they're more complicated. So for the vertex splitting lemma, we need that um, <coughs> not only that the contracted graph is globally rigid, but we also know that, um, need to know that um, the original graph has an infinitesimally rigid, so this is a slightly stronger version of rigidity, um, realization in our day in which the two vertices are on top of each other. 
So it's not generic because we have two coincident vertices. And then for the, the glowing lemma is more straightforward, it's just that we need at least d plus one vertices in common in order to destroy the reflection. So our, our pro for us, um, Fogelsanger's um, idea uh, structure, so we, show, we characterize when a, a simplicial D circuit is globally rigid in arc D plus one. So it's globally rigid if and only if it's a small complete graph, it's, it's one skeleton is a small complete graph, or it's D plus two connected, we need D plus two connect connectivity because if we've got a D plus one vertex cut, we can reflect one side of the vertex cut in the hyper plane which goes through the D plus one vertices in the cut. So, so if it's only D plus one connected, it can't be globally rigid. And then what makes our proof more complicated is that planar graphs are a, a whole family of counterexamples. Uh, and they're, they're not globally rigid for a different reason. They're not globally rigid just because they don't have enough edges to be globally rigid. So in order to adapt Fogelsanger's proof, we, we turn this nice simple proof into a, um, a horrendous, uh, well, I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but it, it's, it's much, much more complicated. So we have to have this U, in order to do the vertex splitting, we need this UV coincident property. And we prove that the UV coincident property holds for some edge, again, by using the Fogelsanger decomposition. So the first part of the proof is to show that the UV coincident infinitesimally rigid realization exists using Fogelsanger decompositions. And then once we've got our edge, we use the Fogelsanger decomposition method to prove global rigidity. And the other thing is that, that there's no guarantee. So you can prove that simplicial D circuits are D plus one connected, but in general, they don't have to be D plus two connected. So even if we start off with a, a D plus two connected simplicial circuit, when we take the Fogelsanger decompositions, the, the elements of the decomposition might not be D plus two connected. So we, we have to pull apart the, the, the elements of the decomposition into smaller circuits, which are D plus two connected, and then apply induction to those, and then work our way back to the original. So I, I'd just like to state one more result, which is, uh, um, it's kind of pretty, um, so I, I'd like to mention it, but I, I won't go into the details. So we've also looked at um, symmetric simplicial complexes. So um, we, up till now, we, we just considered symmetries of order two, which are free, so they don't fix any face. So these things have occurred quite a lot in the, lit in the literature, in particular centrally symmetric simplicial complexes. And we're able to characterize when a, um, one of these centrally, one, when a, a Z2 symmetric simplicial D circuit is um, rigid. So this was uh, conjectured in 2019 by Klein, Nervo, Novik, and Jane. And there is also um, there's a res an old result of Stanley, um, which gives the lower bound on the number of edges in a symmetric simplicial polytope. And we've um, the fact that they're, we prove they're rigid implies uh, Stanley's lower bound. And to do this, we, we, we need, um, oh, I think there was one nice example that was I wanted to give. So the, our th characterization is not really a characterization. It, it says uh, it's, it has a rigid realization. So infinitesimally rigid is, is slightly stronger than rigid. 
unless d equals 2 and gamma, so gamma is some um, point group of, of d dimensional Euclidean space. And so when d equals 2 um, and gamma is the half turn rotation group, it may not be rigid. But then the second part of the theorem says, well, if d equals 2 and s is a plane triangulation and, and gamma is this half turn rotation group, then it definitely isn't uh, rigid. But there is a gap because so when d equals 2 um, and gamma is the half turn rotation group and the simple the one skeleton is sufficiently connected, we think it's going to be, um, well, th th there is a gap for d equals 2. We don't quite understand what's going on when d equals 2. But when, when we have a plane triangulation, um, this is an example when it's not infinitesimally rigid. So this is called the Brickard um, octahedron. And the idea is it's, it's a half turn about uh, this axis, symmetry. And if you take, so the octahedron is a, is a simplicial two circuit, so generically it's rigid in r cubed. But if you take this particular realization, which is not generic because it has this half turn symmetry, then it's not rigid. So if I was, uh, better at um, computer simulations, I'd have put this up and I would have showed you how it moves, but I'm afraid um, I'm not so good at that. And well, yeah, this is, to, to prove it, we, we have a, 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 we come up with a Fogel-Sanger decomposition of a symmetric circuit into symmetric sub-circuits. But to finish, uh, I thought I'd give three problems. So our, um, our rigidity result implies the lower bound theorem on the number of edges in a simplicial D manifold extend to simplicial D circuits. So this is, I think, Kali's lower bound? No, it's, this is probably goes back to Barnett. But it doesn't say anything about the other faces. So the first problem is, is, is there a, a, a way of proving this, the lower bounds on, on the number of R faces for 2 less than or equal to R less than or equal to D? But Barnett's theorem gives such a lower bound for simplicial D manifolds. But we don't know whether it extends to simplicial D circuits just because we're working with one skeletons. And then our result for symmetric simplicial day circuits just uses um, point groups of order two, which are free. So can it be extended to other point groups? And then the third problem is a, is a recent paper of Bulavka, Nevor, and Pellet, which, which defines the concept of volume rigidity. So in ordinary rigidity, we, we, the, um, the simplicial complex the constraint is that the length of the edges must be, stay the same. But in, instead of that kind of constraint, you could say, well, I want the area of all the triangles to stay the same. Or I want the, the volume of all the tetrahedra to stay the same. And th this is completely open. Well, not completely open. So, so, uh, but Avka, Nebo, and Pellet say something about triangles of um, triangle, say, volume. Uh, where you preserve the areas of triangles in a, a triangulated sphere. So I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, I, actually I had some questions. I don't know whether I missed it. Uh, 
So he was speaking about complexity of uh, finding out whether it's rigid or not. And then you mentioned algebraically independent uh, um, realizations. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is it like, so then it depends on the graph, whether it's rigid or not. Uh, is it uh, easy, the problem then, if it if it's just depends on the graph? Uh, of, re of re rec uh, recognizing whether it's rigid or not? Um, it, well, it's much easier. It's not, it's not known to be NP hard. So it's, it's, it's easier than the, the, uh, the general problem for frameworks. And there is an easy um, random algorithm. Um, so this it goes back to this concept of um, infinitesimal rigidity. So for generic frameworks, infinitesimal rigidity and rigidity are the same. Uh, and infinitesimal rigidity is uh, defined in terms of the rank of uh, a matrix, which is a, in one dimension, it's just the edge vertex incidence matrix of the graph. So in two dimensions, you get a bigger matrix, and a big, so it depends on the realization. Um, so if you, if you want to decide if a graph is rigid, you can take um, uh, a random um, realization of the graph in, in, in d-dimensional space, and you can work out the rank of this matrix. So if you have a, f um, and if it turns out to be, uh, have sufficiently high rank, then you know that the graph is generically rigid. And so, so maybe you chose the wrong random realization, so you, you chose another one, and another one, and, and the, the, the probability that you get the wrong answer decreases uh, as you choose different random realizations. And the, there is a similar random test for global rigidity. It's more complicated. It uses something called the stress matrix, but again, you could, there is a random algorithm for deciding whether a graph is globally rigid. But being a graph theorist, I, I would like a, a, a structural characterization of which graphs. And I'm, I'm not really so content with random al algorithms. Any, any other questions? Maybe I just have one last question. So in your characterization, like uh, uh, K-circuits, uh, like graphs coming from K-circuits, uh, I, do, I don't have like a feeling which graphs are missing in, I mean like which graphs are you missing by the character, because I guess not all of the graphs are coming from uh, K circuits. Uh, uh, what, what graphs are missing in your characterizations then if you drop the condition on uh, that being K circuit graph? So K circuits are, are special kinds of simplicial K complexes. So just, just for simplicial K complexes, um, your graph is a union of k plus one cliques. And each k plus one clique is, is rigid by itself. So you have these big rigid bodies that are glued together on, on vertices or pairs of vertices, and that really helps. In general, your graph could be arbitrarily sparse, and it could still, be, well, it could have arbitrary high girth, and it could still be rigid. So, so, so looking at, um, simplicial care circuits, we're looking at, we're only looking at graphs which are locally dense, which are locally complete. Um, but, but I would like to be able to, to at least solve the problem for, not just for simplicial care circuits, but for simplicial care cycles or simplicial care complexes in general. Um, but that seems difficult. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the answers. Is there no further questions? So let us thank the speaker again.